Tēnā no koutou. Um, my brother-in-law has a joke in our whānau, and it's how do you trap a Simmons? And the answer is with a microphone and an audience. So, um, we'll, um, for, those of, for those of our whānau that know, know Ngira, they'll probably agree uh, with that uh, sentiment and most other Simmons uh, as well. Um, I, I went to get a drink of water before and said, how do you follow uh, kui hene wirangi, uh, and my very good friend said, you don't. <laughs> um, so pretty much I'm not going to follow uh, hene wirangi, you are. <laughs> um, so this next session is, uh, is a workshop uh, framed around the project themes that have uh, come through the Te Taungo Takungako research project. Um, so I will talk a little bit about each of those themes, uh, but we're really interested to understand uh, what they might mean, what that might look like, um, and what meaning you make from the kōrero that's come through uh, in this uh, research. Um, I wanted to start, though, um, just by taking a little bit of time not to follow from uh, our kuia, um, but to learn from what she shared, um, in particular around the gifts that we give our tamariki. Um, and I was reminded uh, of this, partly because of the image that's on one of our banners of te puna uh, o tu heihei, as we know it. It's known most commonly as te waiho uh, puna, or the blue spring um, within you know, the rest of the world. Um, and I wanted to share a little kōrero about the uh, gift that I gave this particular pepe, my disruptor, um, Hine Karohirohi, uh, and her name was named, her name comes from this puna. Um, so it came from this puna at a time when, um, for those of you that have, have um, heard me speak before, when that puna was at threat um, from increased extraction of water. Uh, to the point where it would be completely um, allocated. There would be no more water available in that puna. Um, so we were, I was hapu at the time, and we were in um, discussions, and we were in negotiations <coughs> and fighting to protect that puna from further extraction. There are already three companies that take water from that puna with no resource consent, so I need to say this additional company was um, going through the resource consent process, we had an opportunity to have a say. Um, and I remember sitting in a hui um, when Fano were debating whether or not to approve this company or oppose the company, and thinking about um, my pepe in my waters uh, at that time, um, and also thinking, oh no, what am I going to do at eight months pregnant if we decide to occupy this particular site? Um, because that's where the kōrero was, uh, was heading. And so I wanted to be able to remember that, um, but also remember the beauty of the puna, because it was at risk. So um, te kā rohi rohi, uh, ironically enough, or coincidentally, or not coincidentally, is the name of her father's tupuna whare, um, down uh, just north of Taumarinui, um, at te kaura marae. And so it was fitting for us that her name uh, came from the puna, but also connected to uh, her maniopoto side uh, through her father uh, as well. Um, it also reminded me, um, though, I, I always wonder how she's the disruptor when her name means the, you know, the beautiful shimmer on the water as the sun hits it. And I remembered that we gave her the middle name Daisy May, which is taken from my queer on both sides of my whānau, Daisy Annabelle Okeroa Whaiapu and Val May Joyce Edmeets. Um, who both whakapapa in different ways to that puna. And they were a force to be reckoned with. And so it was only actually last year <laughs> that I realised that her fierceness actually comes from her middle name that we gifted her, or that her grandmothers gifted her, um, not necessarily from the uh, shimmer. I think that's her distraction. Um, her distraction mechanism is the shimmer while she delivers a, a pretty fierce punch um, underneath. And the reason I wanted to start with that story um, really is, was, was caused by uh, Hine Wirangi got me thinking about the gifts that we had passed on, but also in my own thinking um, that really the story of our relationships, 
The story of the potential of our relationship, relationships is written more truthfully in our whakapapa, in our land and our waters, than it is on any page. Our relationships are relational, and not just relational to each other, but relational to our environments as well. And I think that's been a point that's been made uh, by all of the previous uh, speakers. I also wanted to share this puna um, partly because, um, and perhaps uh, ironically or hypocritically, I'm, I'm struggling to find the correct words today, um, I've been living a little bit in fear about, um, and, and Henny Weedangi said we need to get over ourselves and get out of the fear of doing the mahi that we know will uh, help whānau, and so I've been a bit in fear about the current research that I'm doing, which is retracing mahi narangi's hikoi mai kahununu ki rangi atia. Um, and so whilst I know in theory what that hikoi means, and whilst I know in theory what the place names mean, uh, I have been reluctant to actually physically uh, enact uh, that particular hikoi, um, which is <laughs> quickly uh, coming up. Um, but I share that uh, also because it's within those places on her journey that I can find comfort and courage in thinking about how we raise our children collectively and how we raise our tamariki within a context of love um, or aroha in the very um, deep and broad con uh, meaning that it has. Um, and so my nan, Daisy Annabelle Okeroa Whaiapu, comes from the Marae Ukaipo at the bottom of the Kaimai Ranges. <laughs> um, and again, I want to acknowledge uh, Kui Henewirangi for reminding us that, in fact, we aren't mothers, we are Ukaipo, we are Whare Tangata. That Papa Tuanuku is not our earth mother, she is our Ukaipo, she is our Whare Tangata. And when we give it those labels, it transforms the relationship that we have. Because in a Western framework, the idea of mother is this ever-giving, self-sacrificing <coughs> thing to be used from a Western perspective is not how we understand whare tangata, it's not how we understand ukaipo. So again, just some really big reminders and triggers for me around the way that our concepts are embedded in our places uh, and also the importance of the work that we need to do to actually bring those uh, into life sing those into life um, uh, as well. And it stems back to what Leonie started with by talking about the importance of taking control of our own transformation at whatever scale that happens at. That we need to be resourced and supported to take control of our own transformation, but that we also need to be brave enough uh, to step out of the fear and to have courage to take control over that transformation as well. Um, in this session, there's a few things I want to do. Um, we've talked a lot about collective responsibility and also about the connections and interconnections that exist between people, between people and place, uh, between past, present and future. And so we're going to do a bit of a session around what, what were those connections? What did they look like for our tupuna? What were the ways that they maintained those connections, that they made sure that those connections were strong and bonding and were never um, able to be broken? But also, what do those connections look like now for our tamaiti? What's changed? What's shifted? Uh, and what do we need to do to, again, reshift, or as Rehi said, dream up an alternative uh, to that current situation? I'll talk a little bit about our research themes, um, and then, um, as we've talked a little bit about, uh, I want to think about how we action what it is that we're learning here today. And so we're going to do an exercise around reflect, share and declare. We're going to declare what it is that we can do ourselves in whatever context, at whatever scale, uh, in the next month, two months, three months, six months. Um, I won't restate the overview of the research, it's there. But what I wanted to um, talk a little bit about was the methodology involved in the research. So we did... Um, interviews, whakawhiti kōrero, with 30 people, kaumātua, practitioners, tohunga, whānau, um, a whole range of people. But we also did whānau wānanga. Um, so we did whānau wānanga with groups of whānau collectives as they define them for themselves. Um, and for me this was a really important part of the methodology because it gave us a space to come together. 
a space where we could step out of um, what Leanne Simpson, who we may see tomorrow, um, a Nishinaabeg scholar, um, she says that we are bathed in a vat of cognitive imperialism, which has lots of um, really big words, but really powerful words if you start to unpack them. We're bathed in a vat of cognitive imperialism when, we, when we're out uh, in the Western world. Um, and so she said one of the most significant things that we can do as an act of resistance and decolonisation is come together. That we come together in spaces such as this, in spaces such as all of the various wānanga that we hold as whānau, hapu and iwi, to mobilise, to share, to find a unity of purpose, or perhaps more importantly, a unity of purposeful action. So the ability to come together as Fano uh, through this particular research project was a really powerful one, not only for the research itself, but for the Fano who were involved, because they were then able to think about what Fano well-being meant to them as a Fano, and then start to action some of that directly. They didn't have to wait for a report to come from the research. Um, Leonie said many times before that the journey of research is just as important as the outcome. Uh, itself. So it was really important to us that Fano could see themselves uh, through, this, through the research and take their own knowledge, their own expertise, and start to enact that um, straight away as it, uh, as it worked for them. So we're going to do an exercise now before we actually talk about the um, research themes, because I'm really interested, well we're really interested as a team to hear what you have to think. We know that within our whakapapa are concepts, values and practices that enable us to project ourselves into the future with confidence. We know that whakapapa tells us we have a heritage of hardship and struggle, richness and joy, that we are descendants of creative, courageous and in my case sometimes outrageous people. Our whakapapa enables us to be supported in reclaiming and asserting whānau well-being and we know that it's more than simply genealogy. It's relational, it's multiply layered, it's about connections and growth, and it's within our whakapapa that we can find a wealth of resources to enable us to make sense of and transform our lived realities. Ani Mikairi talks about whakapapa in the following way. She says, whakapapa embodies a comprehensive conceptual framework that enables us to make sense of our world. It allows us to explain where we have come from and to envisage where we are going. It provides us with guidance on how we should behave towards one another. It helps us to understand how we fit into the world around us. It shapes the way we think about ourselves and about the issues that confront us from one day to the next. So on that note, uh, and with those very eloquent words from uh, Fire Ani Mikairi, what I want us to do now is to think about what are the connections and interconnections within Fano in its broadest, deepest, most diverse, messy, complex, beautiful sense of the term. What did those connections look like for our tupuna? Who were they with? Um, so there's a piece of paper on your tipu. I want you to put a tamaiti in the middle of that piece of paper. So there's a tamaiti in the middle. What name, what were all the connections that kept that tamaiti well within Fano, as our tupuna would have understood it? Who were the people? What were the connections between the people? What were the things that enabled and maintained those connections? I'm going to split the room though, so half the room's going to do what those connections were for our tupuna, and half the room I want you to think about now. Put your tamaiti in the middle of the paper. Who, what are the key parties, people, groups that are part of keeping our children well now? How are they connected to that tamaiti and to each other? And what are the values that keep those relationships intact or not, as the case may be? When we actually start to think about how those interconnections existed, not just between people, but between atua, the whenua, each other, um, the past, the future, we start to see the multiplicity, the diversity, um, the depth, the breadth of what those connections were. And we all know that those connections have been stolen, they've been severed, they've been purposefully cut, um, they've been harnessed by the Crown so that all those connections go one way uh, in many instances. We also know that Fano have been able to maintain a number of the values, if not the connections, and or vice versa, uh, in their own Fano, in their own practices. 
So again, this research is not new, but it is affirming and it is a body of evidence that continues to assert that interconnections for whānau are vital for well-being for our tamaiti and for our whānau more generally, and that isolation is not healthy for our tamaiti. Isolation from their own whānau, isolation from wider whakapapa networks, isolation from their reo, from their tikanga, from their pūrāko, from their whenua, from their wai, from their te mea, te mea, te mea, everything that you've said. From te tapu o te tinana, we know, and this has been affirming and been affirmed again by you, that isolation does not work for our whānau. And so really the point of that is for us to remind us again about those interconnections, but as we move through the themes today and tomorrow is to think about how then do we go about restoring those connections that may have been stolen or taken, um, that may be severed or may be hanging at a very loose thread. Um, how do we go about restoring those within our own context, practices, organisations, or perhaps more importantly within our own whānau as a starting place? Um, so that's what I want us to be thinking about. This is the start, even though it's the end of the day, this is the start of us thinking about that as we move through uh, the next little while. We know that well-being exists in being connected to each other within and outside of our own whānau, to our lands, to our water, our pūrāko, our mātauranga, our tikanga and the values that underpin them. And as many of you have said, to the stars and the skies, uh, and the land and all that is below. So where do our tamariki sit within those connections and interconnections, traditionally, now, and where do we want them to sit uh, moving into the future? I think the signal is in the title, ko te o takungako. They should be sitting in the heart place, they should be sitting in the centre uh, of that uh, for us all, as te pā harakeke tells us it should be. I want to talk to you now a little bit, and again, this really is affirming what's been shared already, so I won't um, spend too much time uh, on this, but in terms of the um, themes that have come through, we've organised those around the six kaupapa Māori principles that came through in uh, Graham's uh, early kaupapa Māori work um, and supported through Linda and Leone and various other uh, kaupapa Māori um, scholars. Um, so rather than repeating what these principles are, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that kaupapa Māori as a theory, as a research practice, has transformation at its core. Kaupapa Māori is transformational. It should be, and if it's not, we should not be calling it kaupapa Māori. So by lodging the themes, by lodging the findings that have come from this research within those kaupapa Māori principles, by lodging the framework for well-being of tamariki within the context of whānau, under this, this framework, we should be keeping transformation at its core. It requires that any consideration of well-being for whānau, for our tamaiti, must be transformational. We will not and we cannot accept any less. So to move through each of these, oh, I've got three principles, sorry, I should say, and then tomorrow you'll have another three of those principles shared um, by Wakare Moana. To move through these, I just want to share a little bit um, of, of the kōrero, and this is really like the tiniest little snippet of the kind of amazing depth and um, repetition in many instances of kōrero that came through uh, in this research. But thinking about Fano and Leone's already um, made this point, and everybody here I think agrees that Fano uh, is that big, broad, encompassing um, concept uh, and framework uh, for us, whatever that means for each of us uh, individually. I remember in my PhD um, work, one of my participants uh, said to me, you know, te reo Māori is amazing. It tells us the importance of the, the, the individual body, particularly the maternal body, in relationship to the collective, right? So whānau meaning, meaning our understandings of whānau, uh, but also meaning birth, or meaning to give birth, me no pepe, hapu, meaning to be pregnant, and meaning the collective. Um, she also said, but just because I'm hapu doesn't mean I want the whole hapu at my birth. Um, some people do, but I think it's a really interesting and important thing that we go back to the, the, the duality or the multiplicity of meaning that our real holds. And so whānau is whānau. 
in all of its uh, diversity. Moana Jackson talks about whakapapa in relation to, he says it's a series of never-ending beginnings. Um, and I like this concept, and it, and it speaks to the, the concept of whānau that's come through in this research. He says that the stories we tell as Māori are not always new stories. Neither do they always have an immediate end. Rather, they are born with a particular purpose in mind, told in a specific context, and they may end with more questioning, signalling new beginnings, and highlighting the never-ending scope of knowledge itself. And I think that applies for our conceptualisations of whānau. If anyone tries to define whānau, I think it results in more questions, more beginnings, more constellations of what that looks like. Um, and so whānau is multiple, it's multiply positioned. For some of us, whānau is our whakapapa whānau. Uh, for some of us, whānau is a very different uh, constellation of people uh, that exist uh, within our world. We know um, that isolation and that the dismantling of the concept of whānau is one of the most devastating outcomes of colonisation and one that has been particularly damaging to our understandings of whānau and to the well-being of our tamaiti. Um, in my PhD research, um, one of the wahine that I spoke to said, when are we going to wake up and realise that a combination of poverty, feeling stink about who you are as a mother, as a woman, is a recipe for poor parenting and unwell whānau? If you get that recipe and you add a little bit of sleep deprivation, a little bit of boyfriend stress and a little bit of whānau stress, then the baby gets chucked out with the bathwater. And I think, again, that's been reiterated and we've seen the most um, horrific examples of what happens uh, at the... At the uh, the kind of pinch point of that. We know that indigenous families have endured a lot of trauma through colonisation and that part of decolonisation requires us to rework understandings of whānau. Western patriarchal concepts of whānau have failed to provide for the collective approaches to child rearing that we know and that we practice and that we know ensure the well-being of our tamariki. Within Te Ao Māori, we know that children are born into whānau and not just to a mother and father. And so this calls into question not only the conceptualisations of whānau, but the heteronormativity of dominant conceptualisations of whānau as well. Leone has argued in the past that the limited definition of the family as nuclear, heterosexual and constructed within limited gender roles is not natural, but it's constructed by certain groups to benefit their own interests. Such a definition is not only limited, but it also imposes restrictions on how different groups wish to construct their families. With the nuclear heterosexual family being centred as the norm, the standardised version of family, everything else is measured against it, labelled and judged accordingly, and often punished accordingly uh, in various situations. Um, and one of the things I think is really important to think about in our conceptualisations of whānau is not just that we think about whānau in the broader sense of the word, and a lot of the participants that we spoke to, and I'm not going to read out all the quotes, I think they're there, you can work your way through these for yourself, but one of the things we do need to think about is destabilising the gender roles that come through a Western patriarchal concept of family. Um, and I don't know if we always do that very well um, when we're thinking about decolonising the concept of whānau. Sometimes, and the research has shown, that we might consider whānau in its broader sense, but we actually don't delve into whānau to think about the ways in which some of the roles we take up, or the roles we think we have to take up, uh, actually stem from colonial Christian and patriarchal ideologies. The next theme um, is kaupapa, the collective philosophy principle, really thinking about how we join together. How do we come together with a unity of purpose or a unity of purposeful action, uh, as the case may be? Um, and again, you'll probably realise who my um, academic Jedi are, because I quote them <laughs> often, <laughs> many of them are in the room, um, but there's a few that aren't as well, but Leanne Simpson is one of those. Um, and I really like what she says in terms of we need to join together in a rebellion of love. Persistence, commitment and profound caring and create constellations of co-resistance, working together towards a radical alternative present, not future, present, based on deep reciprocity and a gorgeous generative refusal of colonial recognition. So for me, 
Um, whilst obviously this is a kaupapa Māori principle, I think her work is res- resonates in terms of thinking about all of those things. How do we hold hope and love and use those as tools and mechanisms and strategies to ensure the well-being of our whānau in a situation, in a system that continues to tell us that our love's not good enough for our tamariki? that continues to tell us that how we love our tamariki is not approved by the state, is not aligned with the school state education system. So I I really um, wanted to draw on that. And again, it draws out a number of the principles that came through in the kōrero from uh, from the people that we've spoken to. And really the key theme that's come through most strongly in this research is the need for collective responsibility. Collective responsibility by all, not just by Māori, not just by the state, but by all. Not just by mothers, but by all. Children are part of our wider whakapapa and they are the responsibility of many. Our tamariki deserve to feel safe, physically, spiritually, emotionally and intellectually safe, not just within whānau, but across all spaces. And if they are not safe, we need to equip them and ourselves with the skills and strategies to respond and to resist. Again, this is another um, really important theme that's come through. We need the collective to work, but we each need to value and respect our role, our mana and our uniqueness. Collective responsibility is not about making ourselves the same as each other. Collective responsibility is about recognising the uniqueness that exists within our whānau, hapu, iwi, te ao katoa. Um, Collective responsibility is about thinking about how we work across those differences, but ensuring that our tamaiti are at the centre of that and their well-being is at the fore. So it's not about homogenisation. The collective is not about assimilation. It's not about coming together and saying it has to be a one-size-fits-all approach. And again, all of the interviewees stress this. Whānau well-being and the well-being of our tamaiti, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. We are kaupapa a whānau, kaupapa a hapu, a iwi. Te mea, te mea, te mea. I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of, again, in terms of thinking about collective responsibility, is that we don't lump that responsibility onto an already overburdened few. A number of participants discuss this. They discuss the importance of our mātauranga Māori, um, as you can see here. We have so many things and so much of our mātauranga Māori about our tamariki being the rito o te harakeke. We've heard that time, again, time and again today. And all the tikanga about the harakeke says that nothing can be harmed with that. That tamaiti and that close whānau around it, our motiatia tell us this, we've got that hole. I don't know who it was that said it, one of those early missionaries who said, spare the rod, spoil the child kind of stuff. We never had any of that before. So, so much of it, I think, is the issues around those colonisation and the impact it's had. And now it's swung so far the other way where we occupy some of those worst worst statistics of things that we would never have traditionally done so. There must be something in that about well-being. And whilst we're not um, necessarily focused on colonisation, we can't deny that colonisation continues to impact us on a daily basis and to impact the well-being of our whānau. Kim Anderson says that if, and she's a, um, a First Nations scholar, says that taken uncritically, if we're thinking about uh, mothering, she's talking about ideologies about native mothering, she says, and I quote, run the risk of heaping more responsibility on already overburdened mothers with so many Native mothers struggling to raise their children in poverty or in situations of abuse or neglect, we must question the logic of asking mothers to carry the nations. We must ask ourselves, where are the men? Where are the communities? Where is the nation? And where is the state? And never to forget, where are the children? And I think that really applies in this context. If we're thinking about collective responsibility, we need to ensure that we are thinking about collectives in the plural, and not trying to put everything on one collective or one particular demographic uh, within our whānau.
The colonisation of the collective uh, has been vast, and it was clear from the outset of colonial permeation into Te Ao Māori that Māori collectivism was philosophically at odds with the settler ethic of individualism. Again, this is not new. But not only the colonisation of the collectivism, it's been the colonisation of our children, the colonisation of our tamariki, but also the colonisation of the colonisers' tamariki, which we think is just something that is uh, learnt by osmosis. But in actual fact, colonisation was and is taught as a particular um, very directed um, ideology and set of practices. And so this, you can see, see is, this is the ABCs for baby patriots, just so you, just in case you can't see that, um, from 1899. C is for colonies, rightly we boast, that all of the great nations Great Britain has most. And I think it's really, really important, and again I um, acknowledge Lehi's work around thinking about the way that these things are not only normalised within the upbringing of children over time, uh, within Western society, but also how they then become entrenched in legislation, and then that normalisation is reiterated and repeated uh, time and time again. So we also know, uh, for example, that within Western traditions, children were seen as possessions of their parents, that the uh, Christian marriage um, institution meant that a woman and their subsequent children became possessions became under the ownership of the head of the household. The Guardianship Act, um, as Rehi has pointed out in 1968, said that children are possessions, but not only did it define that, it said that children are possessions only of their birth mother and father. So it completely eliminated any opportunity for us to think about Fano. not that we would consider our children as possessions, we consider them taonga, um, but we also consider them full citizens uh, in and of their own right within our societies as well. So this brings us to think again about the things that exist within our own mātauranga, within our own concepts, the frameworks that enable an alternative present, that have enabled uh, an alternative present mairāno. Um, our ancestors were active resistance of this. Um, and so we come back to this concept of matuarotia as one concept that we can draw on within our mātauranga. I've heard from a number of people that, oh, that all sounds very romantic. Yes, your ancestors lived in a very romantic, idealised time. They did. Our ancestors lived in a time that was designed to promote life. Our ancestors lived in a time that was designed to position our tamariki as te ritu o te harakiki, as te taonga o taku ngākau. If that sounds romantic or idealised, then kei te pai, kei te pai tēnā. That's where I want to go back to. There is an ethics of care within these concepts. There is an ethics of care within our whānau and within our mātauranga. And so I want you to think about what does that ethics of care look like, smell like, sound like, taste like, feel like to you within your whānau. If we are to think about an ethics of care that our tūpuna practised in relationship to the well-being of their whānau, what does that look like, feel like, smell like, taste like, sound like, to you. The question then is how do we fit that ethics of care in the modern world, or perhaps more appropriately, how do we dismantle and reconstruct a world where that ethics of care is the normative practice within our whānau? One of the other things that a lot of whānau spoke about in this research in terms of collective well-being, and it was raised around papakainga and thinking about how we live collectively, what does that mean, was around home and belonging. Not home as our castles, not home as these private six foot high, I don't know how high a fence is, eight foot high, these place fenced, surveyed places, but home as place, home as people, home as our collectives, home as whānau. Home, however, now is not always a safe place for our whānau. Bell Hooks um, 
an African-American scholar, a very fantastic scholar I would encourage you to read if you haven't, particularly those of you in education, points out that returning to one's home is not an option for everyone now. But that does not mean that meaningful traditions and values that may have been part of their past cannot be integrated into home place wherever they make it. So again, we've heard about being a proud urban Māori. We've heard about where we live and how we move around and how we make home. What are the traditions and values that we bring from the then into those home places? And how do we make sure that our tamaiti, wherever they move, make home according to those values as normative practice, uh, as normative uh, parts of their, uh, their belief system? For those who dominate and oppress us benefit most when we have no home place to go. Such was the purpose of the land confiscations, the Native Land Acts, um, the forced removal of our tamariki and our people from their lands and other peoples from their lands overseas. As I've said um, previously, we need a multiplicity of collectives, a collective of collectives. Collectives, collectives. You know when you have a, um, oh, I'm going off track. When you have a mirror and a, mir a mirror and a mirror and it just keeps going back and forward, we need that, but in people form. And we need that because we need to acknowledge the diversity of Fano. And I've talked about this before. We need to understand the life experiences of Fano who have grown up away from the marae who have grown up without their reo, without strong Fano connections, who are just as ma much a part of what it means to be Fano now as those who have grown up in a rural, marae-centred Māori community who are fluent in their reo, secure in their identities uh, as iwi hapu and Fano. We need to make sure that in thinking about Fano and the well-being of our tamaiti, that we don't try and authenticate what a well Fano should look like. The last principle that I'm going to talk about is tino rangatiratanga. Uh, and I think, again, the whole purpose of this space is that we think about how we take control uh, over whānau well-being. Tino rangatiratanga necessarily requires us to reinstate the collectivism of whānau, and this is a, contains a political imperative for the policy and legal environment of Aotearoa New Zealand. It also contains a social imperative that, as Fano, we can transform not only our own lived realities, but we can transform the wider spaces that our children uh, move across. Lots of the participants in this research talked about well-being as rangatiratanga. A well Fano was a Fano that was self-determining, and vice versa. A Fano that was self-determining was a well Fano. Um, and that was a really important thing that came out uh, of this particular research. Linda has also begged the question that how do we know as a people that we are well? Well-being in this sense is at once quite a simple concept, but also quite a complex one. So um, as this particular um, participant has acknowledged, Self-determination, tino rangatiratanga, again sits across a number of scales. Whilst we might be talking about the macro scale systems change that is required, that Rehi has outlined very clearly is required, that many of you will know through your own uh, experiences and roles is required, um, that we know on the basis that many of our whānau are still living in some of the harshest conditions of, of anybody in this country. But there is also the ability to have those micro-embodied um, examples of rangatiratanga, those micro fano examples of rangatiratanga, which I think are as powerful as those macro-systems changes. What is your sovereign light and how do you come into being? How do you recognise, sorry, your sovereign light? How do you recognise that you are standing in your sovereign light? You have the opportunity to be great as an individual. Not only that, how do we ensure that our tamaiti recognise their sovereign light? How do we ensure that they understand their rangatiratanga and they can apply that moving across all the varied spaces uh, that, they, that they occupy in their worlds? 
A number of Fano talked then about rangatiratanga as confidence, as leadership, as resilience, as bravery, and as critical inquiry, giving our tamariki, or perhaps not giving them, but not educating out of them, the ability to ask the hard questions. If any of you have a two-year-old, you know they ask every question that pops into their, <laughs> into their head, and sometimes 21-year-olds and 34-year-olds and 75-year-olds um, ask those hard questions as well. But at what point in our education system do our tamaiti believe that those questions aren't important to ask anymore? Moana Jackson talks about bravery in terms of decolonisation. He says we need to be brave to know who we are, where we have come from, where we are going, we need to know what we need to do to get there. He says there are many ways to transform once we identify what we need to transform and we will each find our own way in which to do it. Similarly, Ani Makaire argues that we need to have courage, courage to question genuinely held but deeply colonised assumptions about what it means to be Māori, courage to determine whether dubious interpretations of tikanga serve us well or whether they further an agenda that puts our long-term survival at risk. Courage to confront those of our own who might have a personal stake in perpetuating such damaging representations. We need to think pragmatically about how we prepare our tamariki for a future as confident and analytical and self-determining people. And we need to do the big work around the systemic issues and around state abuse of Fano and tamariki. The fact remains that too many of our Fano remain in crisis, in poverty, in abusive situations, remembering that the state is the biggest abuser of our Fano. And I think we need to be really clear and call out poverty for poverty. We are, cu uh, we are confusing the culture of poverty with what it means to be Māori with the behaviours and social outcomes of poverty, the crimes against poverty, the violent crime, abusive behaviour and welfare dependency. These are found wherever poverty is found around the world. What we need to call out is that this is normalised and accepted poverty because it's poverty of Māori. Tino rangatiratanga requires transformation. But again, and I use this word a lot, transformation is multiple. Transformation can take multiple forms. Um, so this particular participant says, what I'm trying to do is transform, for example, the entire economic model that has dominated us for centuries. For generations around the world, it's colonialism and imperialism, but it's a framework that puts individuals against individuals and against the environment and te taio and papatuanuku and the interest of profit and power to the few. So if we, are really, if we are really concerned about addressing what we need to have to ensure that we have well tamariki, it would be a model of tino rangatiratanga and mana motuhake that transfers that power back to community and whānau in a way that safeguards us from an oppressive model that concentrates on wealth and power in the hands of a few. For me, that's at the core of what we need and we have to continue to aspire for true rangatiratanga. So whilst big an aspiration around transforming the whole capitalist model, again, I think we can think about transformations as they exist across the full spectrum uh, of, of what that means. We know, whether consciously or not, that we are critical and in-depth thinking peoples that we deal intimately and every day with the macro-scale ideologies and processes of colonisation. This is necessitated by the very real fact that these ideologies, systems and institutions attempt to shape and define our lived realities daily. As such, the work of decolonisation and transformation, while suggesting an end point, consists in fact of ongoing processes that will evolve and involve continual reproduction through our everyday lives as Fano. Importantly though, our rangatiratanga doesn't just radiate externally, but internally as well, in our minds, bodies and our spirits. So I ask, what does it mean for whānau to live, as, to live in freedom?
I'm going to finish my kōrero before we do um, a, a kind of a wrap-up exercise uh, for the day. Um, I wrote a small piece actually about my um, nine-year-old daughter uh, in reflection on the Manawahine claim. So I was nine years old, giving away my age, was nine years old when the Manawahine claim was first filed with the Waitangi Tribunal and my daughter was nine when it was finally uh, announced that it would be heard. Uh, And I wrote this piece thinking about the changes or not that had happened uh, in that period of time from when I was nine uh, and when she was a nine-year-old as well. And I wrote, It is a harsh but very real fact that I will never exist in a world that is not some way shaped by the colonial, patriarchal and racist oppressions that we know now. This... Uh, research, article, writing then is a cautionary but challenging, albeit somewhat depressing, tale of the work that is still needed. The distance between theory and practice still seems vast. This is because the systems of power remain largely unchanged. We teach our children and we tell ourselves that we are born of a long line of ancestors who have gifted us mana, then those children are launched into a world that is set up to tell them the opposite is true. We teach our tamaiti that who they are is important, that they can succeed because of it, not in spite of it, only for them to be told they are too staunch, too passionate, too spiritual or superstitious, non-compliant, too subjective, as if the only people entitled to know or succeed exist only within the confines of rational, disembodied, masculine thought. Our children learn from a very young age about resilience, resistance and resurgence. Mana Fano continues to be of central significance to the lives and lifeways of our tamaiti. We are involved in a decolonising politics, whether knowingly or not. Whānau negotiate the complexities of the intersecting oppressions of colonialism and patriarchy, often class-based and homophobic oppressions as well, daily. I have been overwhelmed by the commonality that has come through in the research that I have carried out in the whānau that I exist in, that despite multiple oppressions and hardships, we continue to uphold the mana of our tupuna and atua. This is by no means an easy task, and it's not to suggest that Fano even necessarily always do so knowingly or purposefully, but rather to assert, and perhaps more importantly, celebrate that mana Fano exists and is embodied and enacted and performed in multiple ways. Kia ora. So, on that note, there has been a lot of amazing kōrero that has been shared. Um, lots of affirming of the kinds of kōrero that you've all shared as well. Um, And so I think it is timely at the end of our day to reflect, share and declare. Because I've talked a lot about action and purposeful action, um, what I want us to do is not just reflect on this session, but reflect on the day's session, including (coughs) Rehi's um, session that she did. I want you to take some time individually. So this First part is not a group exercise. I know that makes us all nervous when we've got to do things on our own. Um, I want you to take some time, some quiet reflection time, five minutes, no talking, reflecting however you want to reflect, whether that's with your eyes closed, whether that's by writing, whether that's just in your head, whether that's by having a kip. Um, Kea koutou, uh, tēra. I want you to take five minutes to reflect on what has been shared and discussed today so far. What does this mean for you personally and professionally, if you're here in that that, uh, capacity as well? I want you to reflect on what you can do to implement some of the things that have resonated for you today. I want you to think about what support, people, systems or resources you need to be able to do that. What we're going to do at the end of the reflection time is in your tables is declare one thing that you will commit to do as a result of your reflections from today within the next three months. So 
obviously make it achievable. <laughs> um, what is one thing? Reflect what is one thing and you're going to declare it to your table. This is where we become accountable to our collectives. What is one thing that you are going to declare to commit to doing in the next three months based on whatever has resonated from today. So we're going to do five minutes quiet time. <laughs> I sound like a teacher, I'm not. Five minutes quiet time, reflection time, and then I'll let you know and we'll do our share and declare. <laughs>